Republican North Texas Congressman Pat Fallon from the 4th District, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. As you know, there is a lot of debate in the last week about whether we are or are not in a recession after two consecutive quarters of GDP falling. And so I'm wondering, what, what do you think? Are we in a recession or are we not? And um, how concerned are you and your constituents about the economy right now? Well, Jack, thanks for having me on. The number one concern for myself and most of my constituents, of course, is the economy. And growing up and uh, being a student of government and uh, foreign, uh, current affairs, and I, I was always taught, and the definition of a recession was, if you have two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. In the first quarter, we had minus uh, 1.6. In the second quarter, we had uh, just under 1% negative growth. That's a recession. That's happened 10 times since World War II. And every single time, it was a recession. So to say this is something else, and I'm not rooting for that, by the way. I want us to grow, and I want our economy to thrive. But we're clearly in a recession. Now, how bad will it be? We're going to find out in the third quarter. Maybe we start to you know, pull out of it. What, what, I don't know. But to sit there and have uh, the Biden administration kind of spin this into, oh, no, this is not a recession, a recession, rather. This is a special exception. It's kind of silly. What do you think the solutions are? Uh, number one is stop injecting trillions of dollars into the money supply. I think that's why we're seeing record inflation, at least a uh, 40-year high in inflation. Unleash the private sector. Texas grows and Texas is successful because we have limited government, low taxes, reasonable regulation, and people feel that they can you know, achieve their dreams in Texas, at least a lot of folks, because I really am a strong believer in people voting with their feet. That's why Texas continues to grow while states like California, Illinois, New York are seeing, um, you know, they're losing electoral votes. They're losing people. They're bleeding opportunity and jobs to, to Texas. So I think for the United States to be successful, we should really follow the Texas model. So you're saying stop government spending, stop increasing government spending. Oh, yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, uh, Joe Biden has put that on steroids in the first year and a half of his uh, presidency. I think that's definitely why we're seeing inflation. Because, uh, you know, and, and also this negative growth too. China, it, this isn't a global phenomenon. China in the first quarter grew by, their economy grew by 4.8%. So clearly something's a little bit amiss. And uh, declaring war in the American energy sector wasn't helpful either. What impact do you think the economy will have on the November elections? Will this help Republicans, do you think? I think there's a clear correlation and it's really, uh, you, you don't want again to benefit from you know misery and woe and dismay. And that's why I, I always root for the country, uh, regardless of who's in the White House. But yeah, I mean, clearly that's why it's on pretty much a foregone conclusion. You never know. And you know, it, it's not over till it's over as they say, but the house seems that it will switch hands to, to the Republican side come November. But the, you know, what we've seen in polling to be quite candid and frank, is the higher gas prices are, the worse the Democrats do in the polls. And uh, so, you know, it's left to be said from, you know, August now through November, gas prices could drop. Democrats may do a little bit better, but if gas prices rise again and inflation continues to rise, and by all measures and metrics, inflation is going to be a problem for the next year and a half, um, then it'll be interesting to see the direct correlation uh, at the polls come November. Wanted to ask you about uh, Congress approving the CHIPS Act, um, about 200, I believe, $80 billion in incentives for companies to expand production of computer chips uh, across the country. We're seeing that here in Texas with various announcements in your district um, and also uh, in Central Texas. And so I'm wondering, how did you vote on this and what, what's your thought on it? Well, Jack, another great question. Uh, so I voted no, and I, I'll explain why, because it, it's kind of uh, counterintuitive, what, what I'm going to say, and then uh, the reason. The semiconductor manufacturing industry, I mean, it's, it's, it, that sector is so vitally important to our country and to our national security. Uh, and if we, we've got Glo Globotech and TI have announced that they're going to have massive uh, expansions, which is wonderful and great news. So you, then you ask, of course, the lead question, lead up question would be a follow up question would be Fallon, then why'd you vote no? This particular CHIPS Act could have been written better uh, and, and a lot better, quite frankly, because what we don't want to see is to bol bolster manufacturing in China. And there were insufficient guardrails 
to protect espionage. There was a couple, a couple hundred billion dollars that were going to be spent along government agencies to do research. The semiconductor manufacturing, that term wasn't even defined in the bill, and it left it to the Secretary of Commerce, uh, Raimondo, to define that. And if it allowed, if you believe it, or, believe it or not, the manufacturers to expand their operations in China, provided that it wasn't a quote unquote significant transaction or a material expansion. And even if it was a material expansion, and that, by the way, those terms were going to be defined by the Secretary of Commerce, provided they were uh, going to manufacture legacy semiconductor chips, they could still do so in China and use that money. And that's not what it's for. So it was dubiously nicknamed the bill, the Chips for China Act. So it was a piece of legislation well intended because we really do, most Americans don't know that the vast majority of semiconductor chips are produced in Taiwan, which is a friend, but is also you know, in danger of a Chinese, a direct Chinese military intervention, unfortunately. And then China's responsible for about 20%, give or take. And then the United States only makes about 11% of these chips. And when you're talking about the uh, newer, the five nano, it's, it, that's the term for, for the size, but the brand new high tech chips, it's even less. So it is a, something we need to address. It just wasn't addressed in the right way. And so did you try to amend the bill or I don't know if you were on any of the subcommittees or the committees involved in that, but were there any efforts to amend the bill to provide more teeth uh, to it as far as against the espionage, as you mentioned, or yeah. um, I know there were some people who said that they opposed it because these were direct corporate subsidies as opposed to tax incentives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and listen, we are in the minority, and it is frustrating, particularly in the House, because it's a majority-driven institution. But what came out of the Senate through negotiations uh, wasn't something, and I think that's why you see there were 33, I believe there were 33 Republican senators that voted no in the Senate. So there were some that supported it, for sure. So I think the Democrats in the Senate, at least, would say that it was a bipartisan bill. Um, but in the House, it wasn't quite as much. We saw it a little bit differently. But I think, it. yes, there were efforts that they didn't succeed. And I would like to see bills like this should have overwhelming support. And unfortunately it didn't. And let me ask you about this uh, deal that was struck between Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Democratic Senator Joe Manchin. Mm -hmm. uh, that would include $369 billion in climate funding, uh, negotiate, allow uh, uh, Medicare to negotiate drug prices uh, with the corporations. Uh, 80 additional billion dollars for the IRS and also 313 billion in new taxes, basically uh, requiring a 15% minimum tax for corporations. Um, I know that's still working its way through the Senate, but if that or some kind of version of it passes, it will go to the House. What, what's your thought on that? Well, uh, I would be a hard no on that uh, if, if it hits the when it comes to the House. Reason being is. In the bill, if you read it, I, I think Joe Manchin got taken to the cleaners on this, uh, to be quite frank, Jack. In the bill, it says that they're going to hire 80, so one of many things that I don't like about the bill, but one of the things was eight, they're going to hire 87,000 new IRS agents. That was part of the Build Back Better, which I call the Build Back Broke, but be that as it may. I don't want to hire 87,000 new IRS agents. I want to hire maybe 87,000 new Border Patrol agents, or at least let the Border Patrol agents we have do their jobs. I, you know, and one thing I've learned in a year and a half of being in Washington is if the bill is named, whatever the bill is named, it very well may do the opposite. So this is the Inflation Reduction Act. I think it's actually going to exacerbate inflation. Why? Because when you, when you put $433 billion in new spending, almost a quarter of a, a trillion, or I'm sorry, a half a trillion dollars, and then the way you're quote unquote going to pay for it is increased taxes on corporations. Well, those corporations are going to pass the, those costs on the consumer, which will do what? raise prices even more. I don't think it's going to do what it's intended to do. And I wanted to also ask you about headlines that were uh, being made in the last week with the mayor of Washington, D.C. requesting assistance from the National Guard with regards to uh, the people who uh, were brought into the country, who came into the country illegally and then took advantage of buses being provided by the state of Texas and the state of Arizona. Um, she said they're overwhelmed. 
Um, what, what's your thought about all this? <laughs> Democrats yeah. call this, you know, I, I was talking to a, another Democratic member of Congress, Eddie Bernice Johnson, who said the governor of Texas is playing, you know, political football here. I would say that the Democrats are playing political football because uh, we have a de facto open border. And it's when I hear Mayor Bowser say that this is uh, it's a humanitarian crisis and she can't handle it. Well, guess what? Cry me a river, Mayor, uh, as one of my colleagues said. The fact of the matter is the border has never been this wide open in our history. And the, the statistics that, you know, show this. In, two, in May, April of this year, we had 234,000 illegal border crossings, which is the highest we've ever had. That was 1,258% higher than the last April President Trump was in office. And then in May, it was eclipsed because May was 200, nearly 240,000 illegal border crossings, which was 930% higher than the last May that President Trump had been in office. We've had 3.9 million illegal border crossings when you couple the known and then the known gotaways. That's the entire state of West Virginia and then some. It is a huge crisis. The drug cartels are making wild profits, one from illegal narcotics and two from human smuggling. They're making now about a billion dollars a month, a billion dollars a month. It is a startling figure because every one of these migrants better give three to four thousand dollars to the cartels and wear a bracelet. And if they don't, they could be harmed or killed. That's the, the sad truth of an open and porous border. So what Joe Biden has done is made every state a border state, obviously Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California, but all of them. And for then Mayor Bowser in D.C., I think we should have an express bus to Nancy Pelosi's house in San Francisco and at Joe Biden's <laughs> beach house in Delaware to really open their eyes up to the fact that we should be controlling our southern border and not the Mexican drug cartels. But isn't it time for Congress to act? Oh, there's no doubt about that. We should in, in, a, in a truly bipartisan way, not some kind of like uh, some playing some games where you get one or two people from the other side and then all of the other ones vote no and it's just shoved down people's throats. But there's a way to solve this. You can have a merit-based immigration system. You can increase legal migration. You can give people points for when they follow the rules. For instance, you have a lot of migrant workers. They, and that's hard work. They should be earning points to, get, to work toward a green card, to incentivize legal behavior. When you incentivize anything, you get more of it. So when you incentivize mass and lawful migration, you're going to get more of it, which, what, which is what this... Uh, administration has been doing. And we can't just have blanket amnesty either because that doesn't work. We need, well, a secure, we need a secure border first. And then I think a merit-based immigration system. My last question, is there any effort? Uh, do you see that happening or not in an election year? I don't see it happening in the next five months. There's no doubt about that. I would be shocked if it did. What I would hope and like to see is in January, let's just assume it, that by all measures, the and predictions and stats, the Republicans, we take the House back in uh, November. Well, let's say we take the Senate as well. Then you've got divided government. And what I'd like to see is true negotiations to say, listen, we all know what we need to do to fix the border. We need to secure it. We need to allow folks to come to the country legally, you know, and we welcome those folks. Uh, but <clears throat> that's one step. The, the other ones are, if we worked together, and as I said, secure the border, but also allow people to come legally and maybe expand the uh, quotas, then we could get somewhere. But we can't just have blanket amnesty and we can't have a very uh, quick path to citizenship. It needs to be earned. Republican Congressman Pat Fallon of the 4th Congressional District, thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate your time. No, Jack, thanks for having me. God bless. Thank you.